three, two, one. Rolling. 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 We are with Carlos Capote, the leader of well over a decade now, the most favorite band according to the uh, poll of Creative Loafing. Yeah, that's a good, uh, That's it's well over a decade and uh, it's been a few years, but I think we can still... You can still make that claim. <laughs> well, hey, it's the people that spoke, so the people are making that claim. They're yeah, not, but they haven't the made most... that particular claim since, I don't remember when the last one was, 2015. Oh, is that, oh, so they don't do the poll anymore? No, they still do it every year, but uh, we just haven't claimed the title since oh. 2015. Who took you? <sighs> I can't tell you for sure. It seems to now that we've they've gone into the digital age. In the early days, you had to still fill out a ballot. All right. Now they've gone in the digital age. You log in and with an email address. It seems like, in the terms of music, some bands can pull off a win, and you can say, "I have no idea who that band is. How could they have possibly pulled that off?" Right. I think some people are more adept in the digital world. Than uh, you know, at somehow generating those kinds of numbers, right? You know, it is. Uh, so you need a you need a good solid digital street team, if you will, a street team. Yeah. <laughs> so instead of hanging flyers and posters, we're. Yeah, uh, I, I just maybe I need to uh, pick a uh, genre of music that uh, that appeals to the technically adept. You know. My uh, my audience is still getting used to this whole uh, vlog podcast. <laughs> oh man! So, um, how long have you guys been a band? Well over a decade. Well, over two decades. <laughs> over two decades. We right? started. The Breeze King started in October of nineteen ninety seven. So wow, that's a good one. Coming moment. up on twenty-one years. Yeah, eligible for the Blues Hall of Fame, the Handy Hall of Fame. Would that what that would be? Yeah, <laughs> eligible, I guess. Eligible. <laughs> uh, I don't know if we're on there. If on we're the on their yet. minds, might have to be a write-in ballot. So, um, did what? Like, what's the genesis? How did you get started? Man. I guess with any kind of off, out of the mainstream music or whatever artistic thing, everybody always talks about it and it seems cliche, but you're going to get bit by some bug. For me, it was in high school. I just, I will never forget it. I know who I was with. I know where I was when I, with a buddy in a car and he put in a cassette of B.B. King. And I just thought immediately it hit me like a baseball bat that it was the coolest thing I'd ever heard. It was real. It was emotional. It was raw. It had all the, you know, great guitar and all the stuff that we wanted and vocals that we were into. But at the same time, it just seemed just really real. And it, it bit. And I think anybody that you meet that has dedicated their life to jazz or blues or folk art or something, painting. You ask them to explain why it happened. Why have you chosen this path with your life? And it's hard to explain, but it just, it bit. And I just became enamored with blues music and I carried it into college and where I grew up and went to high school in South Florida, at least at that time, either there wasn't a lot of blues and jazz going on or I just was too young to know about it. But when I came up to Atlanta to go to school, not only did I find myself with the freedom to go out to clubs 
but I found that there was, it was all over the city. There was all kinds of music and I was, I just got deeper and, you know, I was just starting, this is 21 years ago, just, or when I was just getting into it, uh, started collecting CDs and buying music. And I just became one of those guys. I was just addicted to blues and that's all I really listened to. And a couple years into college, I needed something to do and I bought a harmonica. I already knew what I loved in my head and I bought a harmonica because a lot of my favorite artists utilized harmonica or played harmonica and uh, kind of taught myself to play in the dorm rooms. And it, it never was supposed to go anywhere. It was just something that I was doing like any other college kid that teaches himself to play guitar. But for me, being a blues nut, it was harmonica. So who were your influences with the harmonica? In those early days, I was really into, uh, and still am, like the, the more traditional players, Sonny Terry, Sonny Boy Williamson, um, and of course, a little bit less then than I am now, some of the great Chicago players like Little Walter and James Cotton because at the time, I was just really into, I can actually use my hands because we're, you know, <laughs> that acoustic style playing. Yeah. Big Sonny Terry country blues thing. Skipping ahead as I actually got into playing in bands, I realized that in clubs and venues, that's not the more popular style. That you got to get loud and you're going to put an amp behind you and you're going to have a, a mic. And that's when I s- kind of, veered a little bit towards the more classic electric Chicago blues harmonica players that were playing in a band type ensemble. So when I started, it was really more of the, here's a guitar, here's a harmonica, they're sitting next to each other and they're stomping it out on the porch. And then as I got more into it, the band aspect going to jams and playing along, I realized that I started listening to more ensembles where there was an electric guitar an electric bass and drums and a singer and a harmonica player and transition to that that style of playing i love them both equally and as you know now in our shows i will do both yeah you know sometimes i put down the mic and i just play acoustic style and sometimes i pick up the just different styles but those 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 four that i mentioned and a few others are always at the top of my playlist. So you so you came to Atlanta? So I came to Atlanta to go to school, and I started playing harmonica in college and started going out to local jams and meeting a lot of players around town. The blues scene's surprisingly vibrant in Atlanta, and it, but it also wasn't quite as spread out as it is now 20 years ago. There was a couple key joints you could go to regularly, and you'd meet everybody. So And my timing was good. So you got what? Blind Willies. Guys. It was Blind Willies at the time. There was a place called Blues Harbor. Yep. And Northside Tavern, Fat Matt's Rib Shack. And uh, uh, those pretty much right there took care of me. There was a, a few others that would come and go. But those were the ones that, as a college student, I could get into. Well, I shouldn't say that. Some of them I had to get into by friendlier means. But you know, just get in there and listen and meet people and learn who's who. And uh, even at that point in the beginning, I was just absorbing the music. My playing was just as a hobby. I was still a student. I was never jumping up on stage or anything like that. But there came a point where I was going so often that the other musicians that were there recognized me. They knew I was going to be there every week. And then I would occasionally let let it let it come out that, yeah, I'm trying to learn a little bit of this. I have a quick question for you. And at some point, those people, those guys, uh, said, we need to get you up on stage. We need to hear what you've got. And the right amount of liquid courage, I did it. And then that that bug bit, it was a huge thrill to actually play with other musicians in that 
beautiful, coordinated craziness that we call live music. Up until then, it was just me playing in a dorm room by and myself. It's that connection. If you've never been on stage, it's hard to explain it. To it's people. hard to explain. <clears throat> it's the connection you have with the band, uh, uh, you know, in the moment of the song, and then the connection that you have with the crowd. And if you, if you're if you've got the band connection going and you guys are in sync and you got an energy from the crowd coming, it's just it, it's a high. That's absolutely right. I mean, it's it's this instant feedback and the, and they feed each other. The more connected the band is the more that energy is radiating out and it equal and opposite reaction. The stronger it's going out, the stronger it's coming back and it just kind of keeps fueling itself. And it's, it's a whole lot of fun, much like any other creative endeavor or anything that you do, whether it be creative, when you do something and you get positive feedback, you want to do it again. That's what, that's how we're pre-programmed, right? You know, Pat a dog on the head and he'll do the trick again. And so that was my first time of getting in front of people and playing. And, you know, for every musician, those first few times aren't always so great. But if you're lucky enough to have encouragement and people telling you you did all right, don't worry about it, try again, it gets better and better and better. And next thing you know, I graduated and I started working out in the real world, but I hadn't let go of that. By, the, by then, I was already playing in bands, just occasionally here, once or twice a month, here and there, and it kept picking up. And I was only briefly out of school before I got the call, hey, there's a Thursday night slot opening up at Northside Tavern. Do you want to put something together and take that slot? What year was that? That was 1997. And... Ellen Webb, the owner at that time, she's passed away. Uh, you know, again, I was so there. I was there every week and every weekend, someplace. You know, without being a musician, I was known in the in the community. Yeah. Uh, well, I mean, obviously known and respected enough at that point to be given a slot at right. Was I? Well, I'm. I'm yeah, I'm blurring some that. of the exact. Yeah. I was around enough, and then I started showing up at the jams, and I was at the Monday at the open mic jam every week, and earning my rank at the jam. Instead of going on at two o'clock in the morning, I was going on at one o'clock in the morning, and then at twelve, and then I was getting prime time slots at the jam, and then I actually had somebody at the jam come up to me and said, "Hey, we got a band, we have a harmonica player, but he can't make it." You want to fill in. And I did a couple gigs with that band. They, their harmonica player was a, he uh, was a cameraman for, uh, ES, he was either ESPN or Turner basketball. He did the Hawks games. So every time there was a Hawks game, he couldn't he make was it out. to the show. So I would get to fill in. And, you know, everything falls into place. He was out one time too many. They liked me. I got his job. And then I did that for a little while. And then the call came, do you want to put together your own thing and do uh, take the Northside Tavern slot? At that time, like I said, I was playing with two different bands as their on-again, off-again harmonica player. So then I started my own thing, went to a third, and eventually that third thing, my own thing, replaced the other two. So you got you got two... Uh, two Big tasks ahead of you at this point. <laughs> task number one, find a name. <laughs> right. <laughs> task number two, find a set group of players. Yeah. And, you know, putting together anybody who's done it, they know how it is. Trying to put together a band is just, it's tough. Especially if you've already got a direction for that band. It's not just four guys going, man, let's put a band together and what do you guys, what do you like? Whatever. This was a slot at a well-known blues bar and and I am a blues nut. So there's no question about what we're going to be playing. I'm trying to put together a blues band. So I had a roommate at the time who happened to be a blues guitar player because that's what my entire friend circle looked like at that time. And so that was an automatic. 
And then we had, we were both playing with other bands. It was about a two week mad dash to try to figure out who was going to play with us. You added one more thing that every band has to deal with. Cause at this time, maybe not every band I had, there was no set plan for me to be the front guy in singing. Really? Absolutely not. Oh, that, okay. That's, I had never in my other two bands, I maybe sang one song a night begrudgingly. That was not my thing. So me and the other original guitar player who's back in town now, his name's Mark D'Alessio. You've probably seen him. Uh, we were like, who's going to sing? And I was like, you? And he was like, you? And I lost. <clears throat> we did a quick self-trial within the two of us, and it was pretty clear that he wasn't going to be the one. <laughs> I mean, you know, not because I was good and he was it just, that was just, you know, you know, when you know, you know. Right. So suddenly it was like, all right, we need to find a bass player and a drummer, and we need to have, find a list of songs that we're going to do, and we got to do it in a week and a half when our first Thursday comes around. And uh, we basically, <laughs> this is all the way it went down. We we studied our CD collections and we figured out which five or ten CDs we had in common and we picked songs, 20 songs off of those CDs. So it's like, I know you got the CD and I got the CD so we can go home and practice on our own. Yeah, there's no YouTube Back then, right. or no easy no way to do music. And no rehearsal space or right. anything like that. We're just going to learn them. And we're going to get two seasoned guys to join us on bass and drums that can wing it when we call those no, those tunes out. And that's what we did. And we ended up using a couple guys that were known in the scene. And there's one has moved away, but it was Dave Roth and Joe Caprera. Dave Roth on bass, who's still around Atlanta. Yep. And Joe Caprera, who has since moved to Pittsburgh, um, but no they were, Dave, uh, I don't know Joe, but uh, but they were Dave. they were already playing around town, and they fit, they were willing, and so we decided. All right, and that those first couple of weeks, I was standing there holding a piece of paper, singing. It was really rough, but it was fun, and. There was something there. Good crowd response? Good, you know, it wasn't like it is today. I mean, no. like the North Side wasn't, it was popular, but it wasn't as popular. Right. And uh, there wasn't a whole lot of pressure. Like, it, there was, I wasn't going to lose the gig because I wasn't good enough yet. I was, it was just a, it was a good scene and I was, I knew the people at the club and they knew me and there was, you know those clubs they're like, they're like a family when you're there enough yeah and it, there was nobody sitting there going this is just not working out after day two it just it was going to give me time to let it develop everybody was very supportive so if back then I, I could come to you and say um I can tell you where you're going to be every Thursday night for the next 21 years no way no way no way right like I said at this point, I have graduated. I have a full-time job like I'm supposed to have. I have an engineering degree, and I have a full-time job with a well-known international company that I go to every day. And then at night, I sneak out. And I was working even then. We were doing every Thursday with this band, and then I would have a lot of Fridays and Saturdays at first with the other two bands that I was playing with. Because it was a, a few months before we got our stuff together enough on Thursday nights to actually try to book it anywhere else. But, um, so in the meantime, I'm doing the Thursday nights things with my band and I'm doing weekends with these other two bands and I'm trying to balance all that with a job, but single you know, though, so single doable. young doable, got the, the energy to do it much less sleep required. Getting back to what you said before about the name, obviously we had to come up with a name. 
there is a long tradition in blues music of these names that uh, imply status or royalty or, you know, this music was originally a very uh, rural, urban music and not considered to be upper class. And I believe a lot of people, what they think about when they think of blues and they, the costumes and stuff like that, it might be costumey now, but I, there was, there's a lot of history to the music. Same with jazz. The musicians of the 20s and 30s and 40s, they dressed up because they were elevating themselves. They were no longer working in the fields. They were no longer what they considered the lower class. They had risen above. They are now respectable musicians with a skill, and they dressed that way. That's why you see all these guys wearing suits. Nobody had seen the Blues Brothers in 1950. Right. You know what I mean? Yep. Uh, when those guys were putting on suits and fedoras, it was because that's what they wore. That's what the style was of people. You know, you don't, it's not that, not that far-fetched. But anyway, so some of the great bands from early days of blues. Little Walter's backing band was called the Aces. And, you know, even the the uh, the record labels. Uh, Ike Turner's band was the Kings of Rhythm. And the record labels, Duke, uh, King Records, Ace Records. The list goes on and on. There was always this symbol. And there was a lot of great bands that had this Kings. And so being a student of the music, I was like, I, I want to be something kings. I want to carry on that tradition. So we knew that, and we were going through the dictionary of words. This kings, that kings, that kings, that kings. We couldn't figure out anything. In those early days of my playing, somewhere along the way, I'd picked up the nickname Breeze, Cool Breeze. And so Stony Brooks is a very well-known popular harmonica player back then and now was we consulted with him we need a good name and he's like why not breeze kings for carlos he's going to be up front singing right and so don't like, so stony said that stony stony so God, i give that. mudcat credit for the nickname breeze for myself and stony was the one that said breeze kings and it was one thing like, well, what does it mean? It doesn't mean anything. That's that's what makes it unique. It gives what you want. Yeah. And we were like, whatever, we need something that's cool. And that's that's the genesis of the name, you know? And so then it was just about we gotta learn some tunes. Yeah. And we we just winged it for a few months and built up this good old 20 song set list that we would stretch out forever with solos and jamming and stuff like that. And then, so that was October we started, but everybody, everybody in the original Breeze Kings was playing with other bands for the, for their main so, gig. So it was, it was a, it was a Thursday night. It was a Thursday band. night thing. That's it. Steady gig. Everybody Thursday else go night. do your other stuff. Everybody's playing in other bands, but Thursday nights, we, you know, you still do that to this day. You get a steady gig, you're going to take it. Well, I mean, where else are there steady gigs? There's not very, too many. very few. Very I think few. Mike Veal has. There's a few much guys a around town that have some steady, yeah. steady gigs. But when you get one, you you make room for it in your life. And in those early days, I mean, I'm not saying people would get other gigs. We would fill in here and there. Uh, but we saw it coming together. And 1998 comes around, New Year's Day, and the guitar player, Mark, tells me, look, my band got a Thursday night gig. We're going to be playing up in Norcross at some steakhouse on Thursday nights. I can't do Northside anymore. And so somebody back then, this is December 97, is saying, you need to try 
Jim Ranson. And I'm like, the guy from the Urban Shake, Urban Dancers? Shake Dancers? Very popular band. And I, and they said, he's not with the Urban Shake Dancers anymore. He's been gone from that band for a few months. Really? I knew who the Urban Shake Dancers were. I'd seen them. But I didn't know Jim personally. We knew of each other. We went to the same parties and stuff like that. We had a lot of the same friends. So I, somebody gave me his number. I called him. I said, hey, why don't you come down? He came down that year. I'm pretty sure Thursday was New Year's Day. And he came to the north side to see to watch our show. And he just sat there. I can I can give it to you because we can do it. He just sat all night. Like this. <laughs> and I thought That's his Man. excited face. But there, I thought he hated it. And I was like, Man, this guy, you know, he was in a great band. I'm kind of bummed that he's not digging what we're doing. And uh Turns out the Urban Shake Dancers or whoever he was playing with that had had a New Year's Eve gig and he wasn't feeling so good on New Year's Day. So uh. at the end of the night, I'm talking to him like, well, what do you think? And he's like, yeah, man, I'd love to do it. Give me the tapes. And I, and I was like, wow. And I gave him tapes. And it, it was just that when we joked about that forever, like he really liked it. I was playing all this great music and it, it was just a perfect thing you know we got to know each other and obviously we played together for 20 years so we developed a great friendship but it just worked out that we both loved the same music we were both into the real 50s and 60s chicago blues and into the country blues it was just a match made in heaven for 20 years jim and i never had a problem like we should do this song now i don't like that song we should do this song. we had a couple that that we didn't always agree on. Like we would, I like this one better, but we just loved the same music. And that goes a long way yep. towards keeping a band together when you're doing the music that you both, there's no, some one person has ultimate deciding and you just better go along. And in as luck would have it, Dave Roth was also way into the same music. Our glue for the three of us was Howlin' Wolf. And you know yep. what Howlin' Wolf gonna means to, to this that. band. Oh, yeah. Uh, but it, it wasn't playing that way. It was just like, that's my favorite. That's my favorite, too. That's my favorite, too. So we just started adding these things, and that we'll get to that. So it just worked. Thank you, but it worked. And by early the next year, once Jim joined, we were like, this is we got something going on here. This is cool. We should start booking this. And I started hitting the other blues bars and we started booking it. And slowly by probably not too many, much longer after that, everybody had dropped their other projects and we were pretty much sticking with the Breeze Kings. And, uh, you know, you always pick up gigs here and there, but, and fortunately I have just enough discipline and work ethic to make the effort to keep the band busy. And, you know, I never, it wasn't ever my intention to be a front man. It was never my intention to be a band leader and to start a business and do it for a living. But like you and I were talking about before we started, I do have a tendency when I go to do something, I kind of go all in yeah. and I want to do the best that I can. So like I did, I booked the band and I, I had a job. I had some, I was single. I had extra resources to say, like, I am going to go do this and I will pay for our first CD and I will uh, pay for this and pay somebody to do that. And uh, and I'll make the effort. I'll get on the phone and I'll do this and I'll go to kink and make posters and I'll drive over there and deliver them. And I will burn cassettes. I will dupe cassettes all the time. And right. I, you know, so, so you're getting into something really important right now. <clears throat> two different modes for a musician. And really, there's two different kinds of approaches. And not everybody can do it. And one is a musician who plays in a band, learns the songs, shows up to the gigs, makes their money and goes home. And then there's someone that leads the band. It is so much harder to, A, 
lead a band because you're doing it. You're the manager. You're the booker. You're the poster hanger. Yeah. You're the you're you're Don't handling even all get the decisions. Me started because yeah. it's, it can be the kind of thing if you let it, it will frustrate you to the point that you want to get out of music because you start getting upset at your it builds resent at your your bandmates. And you you start going, somebody's gotta do something besides me. Right. But you then you have to come to terms with it's not gonna happen. Not everybody has that in them. Not to mention you start seeing the results. Like if, if I make the phone calls and talk to this person, we could book this gig if this other person makes the phone calls. It might not happen because he doesn't he or she doesn't know what to say. Well, not, you gotta deal with booking agents, you gotta okay. deal with club managers. It is there is so many more skills and so much more frustration. See, I you had the talent to be the the front guy and to put a band around you and all that. I never had the talent to play in another band. <laughs> like I could sing in another yeah. band, but I, I like original stuff, right? Yeah. So I, I was kind of I'm forced by proxy into booking the gigs and leading the band. And for me, um, and we'll we'll kind of talk about how we sort of melded together. Yeah. But to me, it, it's you know find the band, book the gig, find the band, but never be in a position um, to do music 100% full time. But I look around at a band, you're right, the resentment after a few gigs, you get a complaint or you get someone that can't practice or you get someone that needs to do this or, or uh, complains about money on a gig where I've lost money and covered it to, to make mm -hmm. sure you get paid yeah. and then you complain. It's crazy. You're just like, you know what? And several times in my life, we, you talked about getting bit by the bug, I've walked away from it yeah. and I always come back. Because uh, it, it's something you have to do. You something can't you get have that to do. Feeling. I hate to say those cliches, but yeah. you just go, look, if if I don't do it, it's not going to get done. And, you know, it, once you get a few years under your belt, even the other people in the band, young bands are different. You get seasoned players, they also come to a realization that they know, everybody knows who's making the effort or the extra effort. I don't want to diminish there's music being played here. And if you don't have the right musicians, right. it does then the chemistry doesn't happen. But all that other stuff, I mean, you know, I have to every once in a while remind the guys when they will mention something about, oh, I looked on the website and the, the time said seven instead of seven thirty. I'm like, so I made a typo, dude. I sent you five emails that said seven. Like, cut me some slack. Yeah. That website didn't just happen by itself. Right. I'm the musician that has over 20 years painfully figured out how to basically upkeep a website. Very basically. I'm not a web designer, but I figured it out. Just like we were talking off camera about how you figured out how to put this studio. It's trial and error. It's figuring it out. And I took the time. And, and every, I mean, when this music business, every day it's something's changing. In the beginning, on our website, if you wanted to buy a CD, I had a mailing address. Mail me a check. Then I had to figure out how to PayPal. And now you got to, then you had to figure out, uh, I used to do mailings, postcards. I had to go to Kinko and print them on six to a sheet and cut them with the blade and keep a mailing address and put stamps on them. Then all of a sudden, email lists come out. And, you know, now, then there's social media. Now... You know, it just is constantly changing and evolving, and you've got to figure it out. Somebody just the other day, I know we're going off on tangents, but no, this somebody, is a good. This is this is good this is information. Good. This is what any, being in a band is all yeah, about. Yeah, anybody that wants to talk about the glamour and and all that of being a band, this is a the back end band. work, a working, a working band, right? Band. This is this is what you know. Keeps I love telling you the stories about the Breeze Kings because I'm proud of what we've done, and I love the music that we play, and I just I really do. But I've told it a lot. But when I'm sitting down and talking to my young daughters about my job, they're like, your job is so fun. I'm like, while you guys are at school, I'm sitting at my desk and doing all this stuff. And that's what I'm talking about. It's like, you know, I went from cutting these postcards and mailing them out to figuring out. Somebody asked me today what I was getting to. Do you guys take credit card payments? And, you know, 
few years ago, you didn't have the phone that you could put the little thing in and right. swipe it. But when it start when it starts getting popular, you constantly have to evolve. Just like any other small business, if you start a business, you know, people start saying, "Well, are you on social media?" You know. My barber shop has an Instagram <laughs> yeah. account. Are you on, are you on the MySpace? I remember MySpace. I was trying to figure yeah. out my, what it what. And then someone brought up getting poked on Facebook. That's the first time. Remember that one? Yeah. yeah. First time I ever heard of Facebook was it getting poked on Facebook, and it's and you yeah, you got to learn all of that. You know, for a, I resisted like then I for a long time. Okay, I got the website. Oh, do, are you guys on MySpace? I resisted that. I'm always like a year behind the curve because I resist, and then I realize all right, there's no avoiding this. This current, you got to get in on it. And when you do, you got to learn. And you got to learn how to maximize these things. And tomorrow it'll be something else. You know, every time, once you figured out MySpace, MySpace was gone and it was Facebook. Once you thought you had a handle on Facebook, Facebook is old news. Now it's Twitter and then it's Instagram and then it's this, you know, and you got to stay on them. And then it was digital music. Yeah. You know, make CDs. Sell them at your show for cash. No, now you got to have it on iTunes. I mean, now everybody's got iTunes, but from over my time and your time, all this stuff has come around. How, man, I got to get on digital. How do I get on digital? How do I get on Spotify and Pandora? And how do I, and how do I deal with streaming? You know, everybody at first was like, no, man, I'm not putting my stuff on those free sites got to come buy my CD. Well, then eventually you're like, no, I want, and it's, and all this stuff is what you've got to do, whether you're in a band or you own a bicycle repair shop. Yeah. You got to do it. You got to keep up with what you're a small, a band is a small business. If they're working. I was about to make that point. It is a small business. If you're working, it is a small business and has to be treated. And it has to be treated as such. You are going to work every day. You are booking clients. You are dealing with customers and you got to make them happy. I know not a lot of people don't want to think about that. There's one in every thousand that gets to be rock stars and stuff like that. But the other 999 of them either, it never works out and they go on to become adults and get their jobs or they become working pro musicians. And that means they go out one, two, three, four nights a week and they perform for people that will pay them to do it, whether it be for entertainment or, or events or private functions or whatever. And you got to book them and you got to show up. And, you know, I mean, it's just evolved. When the band started, nobody had cell phones. You know, it was like, yeah. you got to do it all ahead of time. And now then it was, I remember as all these levels, it's really funny going, man, it would be really great if first one, you know, I had a job, so I got the first cell phone. I remember. I hate, man, I'm totally dating all this <laughs> stuff. But it's really all this amazing stuff that's happened in the last 15, 20 years. It's really not that long. But it's just, man, it seems like every six months there's a new technology available to us. So now tell phones are common or cell phones. But well, not only new technology, but what you were in my office earlier and it's covered in vinyl. So now yeah, old technology. That's coming, coming back, back too as well. Although it's that vinyl's a whole interesting thing too, because people buy vinyl but they don't play vinyl. The kids, the younger listeners they like the tactile of a of a record but uh do you remember when we were working rehearsing on a show for you and we were out in the parking lot of the rehearsal space and we we were talking about this exact thing pressing vinyl and there was some young girl out there and she said yeah i've got about 12 or 15 records but i don't i don't have a record player i just like records yeah, just like the physical. She told us she just liked to yeah. have it in her hand, and uh, that just blew my mind. But there was the evidence right there, spoken to you and me at that time, and I still get it. Uh, people asking you guys should put, when you do your next release, you should put it out on vinyl, and I'm like, I can't help in my brain thinking, if you only knew how much space in my garage is boxes of CDs. Now that we have four CDs out, I've got 
extras of all four. And do I need now vinyl? Do I need, think about a band again, merch. Nobody thinks about merch. Somebody's got to pay for merch and somebody's got to store merch. You can't just make one shirt. You've got to have shirts in every size. You've got to have all this stuff and you've got to, somebody's got to keep it in their house or their apartment and bring it to every gig and bring it back and keep track and all. I mean, it becomes, I mean, you need, if you start working a lot and you keep wanting to get into that building of a band, like I said, merch, booking, promotions, all that's like that. There's a reason why you start needing additional people that can help you with that administrative work. And a lot of good working bands don't have that. Like myself, where it's just one, if you're lucky, maybe two guys taking on that responsibility and trying to manage it. You know, I've been fortunate. I've been able to handle it without cracking and I've had guidance from just the right people when I needed it to help me with things like taxes and setting up, you know, getting insurance for gear and just things that you don't even think about. They're totally not glamorous. Right. But as you progress, when you're doing one gig or two gigs a month, you don't really have to think about that stuff. But when you get to doing 15 or 20 a month and the f- people in the band, it's their living and they're counting on it. And you got to start uh, accounting for things. You know, where'd that money go? Where's this going? Yeah. You know, uh, so so when you, you put all of that together, keeping a band together, being the leader of a band... Um, ultimately responsible. What is the secret? Because right now, forget 20 years. Forget how many bands in Atlanta have been together and working 20 straight years, mm-hmm. 10 years, five years. It It's almost unheard of. It's very, very rare. It is. So what is what is the magic? I, like how you know have what? You done I it? wish I could tell you what the magic is because I don't know. It would be easy to give myself all the credit. I mean, I could, man, I'm just an incredibly charismatic and talented and intelligent person and I can do it. Is it that? I don't know. It, some of it has got to be just the willingness to get it done. I think at some point, a lot of people just say, I'm not doing it. And then things fall apart or they plateau. Um, I, I think one rule I've always had always is I'm I only want to be in a band with people that I genuinely like to hang out with we're going to spend a lot of time together whether it be in a van or on a stage or in rehearsal or whatever and I just we've already (laughs) we've already accepted the reality that we're not going to get rich we've already accepted the reality that you know the most likely reality. We're not going to get rich. We're not going to be famous, but we are going to have a good time doing what we do. So that's really important to me. You got to get along. You can have your little squabbles here and there, but in general, you got to be able to get along. You got to be able to have a good time and make the best. If you're playing a great gig in front of a great crowd, it's so easy. But the next gig it's not going to be so great. You're going to have to, it's going to be a pain in the tail load in. It's going to be not a lot of money. There's going to be not much crowd. Whatever the thing is, you're on the road, the hotel that they provided is going to stink or they didn't do this or they didn't do that and you're going to be miserable and if you let that get a hold of you and you start spewing out that negativity It can become a cancer in the band. Anyone that's been in a band for a little while, if you've got somebody that complains or is unhappy, it can be a real bring down for the whole group. Yeah, Know it all. All that stuff. All that stuff. Um, But if you can all laugh at it together and know that, I'll tell you, it's another one that I tell 
my kids. One of the best things about being in a band and having this as what you do for a living is the, the stories that you've got to tell. Even the stories that you and I have to tell for our eight, nine gigs that we've done together and the things that we've done. I mean, like, it's unique. It's fun. It gives, it, it's, it's an adventure like anything else is. And yeah, that's I a good relish word for it. adventure. I relish it and it builds a camaraderie. When you're around other musicians and you can sit around and tell your war stories, we've all done it. We've all had this gig and that gig and that happened. And it, you know, it, it's, it's, it's a connection and, and it's a unique thing. I mean, I've just had some crazy stuff happen. I've got my stories in life because of it. And we can laugh when things go wrong. We can laugh. I always tell the guys, man, we'll make, we'll make the good money together and we'll make the bad money together. And we'll have the, the, the sweet gigs where they've got a beautiful green room and they've got hot towels for us and a deli tray and, and drinks on the house. And then we're going to play the ones where we're cramped in a corner yep. and, uh, you know, the toilets don't work and we got a $5 bar tab for five guys. And we're not, you know, but when we do it together, it's part of the overall experience, the culmination of all the stuff we've done, you know? Yep. And I think it makes it easier to get through. So back to your original question, I, I surround yourself with guys that you can have some fun with and joke around with and um, as much respect as you can spot, spot the problems early, you know, if, and deal with them if you can, unfortunately in this game, there's some problems that, you know, you see that addictions and problems can get a hold of somebody and you try to help out with that or personal issues, family issues, all that stuff can't avoid it. You can't, have, again, there's some things that really are not unique to music, but they sometimes they might be more amplified in, in the personalities of the type of people that would take to make music. Everybody's got home problems. But, <clears throat> thing with music, and if you're going to talk like addiction, yeah. um, there are a couple hours a night, 45 mm -hmm. minutes, three hours, whatever it may be, where that is on public display. And they they it, it becomes very visible because mm -hmm. very visible to the band. Yep. So you got to try to play with someone who's yep. obviously not at their best. Yep. becomes an emotional problem. But even behind the scenes, all of that on stage, when it gets to a point where it's it's affecting that, like everyone sees it. Yeah, you can't hide it. In a lot of industries, you can hide your addiction. I hid mine for mm -hmm. two years. Um, you can't hide it. So in music, it becomes like very public. And something that you and have sometimes to you're almost playing a tug of war with it because it can be entertaining. We you know we're it's a weird society. Some people like to watch the train wreck. Absolutely. You know, so you know, as a band leader, I've played with guys that have imbibed too much and they're not at their best. But in their mind, they are rocking. They're playing great. And if you come down on them, there's going to be somebody out there who's like, oh, man, it wasn't that bad. Nobody even noticed. And those were those little, man, those little thorns start sliding in. And they're tiny, but they don't go out. And they start poking at your whole, your bigger picture. And they, they start crumbling it. You're poking little holes in your foundation and it's starting to get weak. Like after sorry, I'm drinking too much soda. <laughs> Great, we caught that one. Yeah, yeah. Um, but you know, after the fourth, fifth, tenth, twentieth time that you've got a band mate that is falling apart by the end of the gig and can't take care of his own shit, you know, and you're tired. Like, man, we're, we're adults here. I don't want to babysit you. Come on, man. Yeah. Get it together. 
uh, or you're trying to, you know, God, I've had guys just say really dumb things to a waitress or a bartender. You're like, ah, oh, come on. You just had to say that to her. To get a deal with it. You got to deal with it. And nobody wants to deal with it, but everybody wants to be buddies. They don't want friction. And again, then it suddenly comes back to, now I don't get to be a buddy. Now I have to go back to being band leader. Because in the end, it's the band leader that has to deal with that stuff. It's the band leader that the manager is going to come over and say, hey, one of you guys did this, or it's not his tab went way over, he's got to pay, or did did your guy just say something to this waitress? You know, and you're just, oh, God, sorry about it, man, I'll, I'll make it right. Or, you know, we're, you guys start in five minutes, are you ready to go yet? Oh, so-and-so is not here yet. I mean, there's, it comes, it starts to get to a lot of stuff that you, that you didn't sign up for. And all those things, man, if you decide you're going to do something for a living, I always I said I learned it from other people. This is work. It's, yeah, it's a business. It's the funnest yep. job I'm aware of, but it's work just the same. Tonight, I am going to work. Tomorrow night, I'm going to work, and the next two nights after that, I'm going to work. I just happen to have a job that I like. I'm one of those lucky people, but it's still work, and I... No, my job is clearly defined. Start entertaining at this time, stop entertaining at this time, and sell drinks, sell food. That's what it is. Or sell tickets. That's your job. That's the same job as Steven Tyler's and uh, Taylor Swift. That's their job sell people are paying them whether it be phillips arena or you know so and so's barbecue and blues joint you're selling you're 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 providing an attraction for them to come and buy the food buy the drinks buy the tickets buy the t-shirts or whatever so that a bunch of people can make some money and you can't ever lose sight of that if you don't do that they don't need you yep and in dealing with it you have i love this word fiduciary you have a fiduciary responsibility to your band to your bandmates to keep working and to keep making sure that they can do this for a living if you got one person yeah you pissing asked, off a waitress there's a pretty obvious you said you asked what uh the secret the secret to keeping a band together 20 years keep them busy I mean, that's one of the not so, shouldn't be that hard. And it, well, it's hard to do, but it should be pretty obvious. If you can, if you tell any musician, hey man, I can, I got uh, 150, 200 gigs a year if you want to sign up for this, but this is what I expect in return. We're going to rehearse X number of times a month and you're going to have to learn this. And when, you know, what, whatever, however you're, you know, every band is a little bit different. When you go on the road, you got to do this. But you tell the guy, this is how many times we gig and this is how much money we usually make. What's the difference between that and saying, I want you to come work in my company and I'm going to pay you this salary. And these are the terms of the job. It's exactly the same. If you want that job, you got to fulfill those terms. If you're only, you know, most guys, they want that job. So they're going to tell you, yes, I'll do whatever just like in the corporate world. Whether or not they can actually fulfill those terms is then left up to somebody to decide every how many times a year do you have to do a review with your supervisor when you were in the corporate world? Oh, yeah. A couple times a year. It's, it's, yeah, it's every like six that, months. You know, uh, so. and, and you got to prove your worth. You yeah. know, every week you come in, you got to leave with something positive. Um, music... and. and it, people try to say, oh, well, it's different in, 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 in music. You know, people are always trying to steal your bandmates. Well, in the corporate world, you got recruiters calling you all the time. If you're a certain level, if you're a really solid player, 
or you're a solid, Absolutely. you know, you're a database administrator, people are coming after you. So you got to have it. So what I'm trying to get at is what you've done to keep this band together, steady working, that Northside Tavern gig, it, 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 it's a remarkable feat. So at some point you step back and you go, however it happened, I'm, I've made it happen. So however it happened, I'm glad it happened. And the parts that I can take credit for, I'm proud of. I'm proud that I figured out how to do my part. Uh, I acknowledge that some of it is luck and good fortune and all that stuff like that. But I also happen to be a believer that you can make some of your own good luck. You can make it happen. Uh, you know, I do make the phone calls and I do try to book the gigs. And when I go to a place and play, I try to put on a good show. I try to play good music. I got a lot of competition out there. There's bands everywhere. And not all of them are made up of guys who are trying to make their living doing it. This is the dilemma for every band out there. There, are, You're competing against guys that the money doesn't matter. And you're a guy where the money does matter because you're paying your light bill with it. And I don't begrudge those guys. Everybody shouldn't have music in their lives. And uh, I'm glad that it came playing music because it, it's in, it's in, it enriches your life to play a little music. Yep. Um, but when you choose it as a vocation, it, you know, there's people that love to make furniture, but when they decide they're going to become a professional carpenter and make furniture, now you're making furniture for other people to their specifications. You're sometimes no longer making art and you've got to deliver it by a certain deadline and it's got to be up to this quality and you've got to do all that stuff. And it becomes a job. You're thankful for it. It's a job that you enjoy doing, but it's a job just the same. And you got to, you got to do it to a level that you'll get repeat business. Yeah. So, you know? so then we talk about that's, that's your normal band day to day business of being a band. <clears throat> so how do you pull through a tragic event. So you guys had a big car accident. So, yeah. And actually lost a member of the band. We were actually playing a wedding with somebody that uh, had seen us a bunch of times while they were dating and called us up to be a part of their wedding. And we drove down to Jacksonville and we played their wedding and we had to be back in Atlanta for another show the next afternoon. So we were leaving early in the morning. And tragedy. We were cut off by another driver, had to swerve to avoid this, swerve to avoid that. And the van rolled. Unfortunately, one of the members that was sleeping in the back of the van didn't make it. Tragic. But. Again, I'll, I'll bring it back to the three guys that did make it. We were all been friends for a long time. And it was tough. We had to get through it, but we didn't get through it separately. We got through it together. We were real friends I think I, I repeat it. I don't know if I can sell that idea, but it's, I don't mean to say sell it, but it, it was critical. Like we're real friends and we're going to deal with it together. And, you know, we really thought about the thing, like what would, what would the one, the person we lost was our drummer, Tim Gunther. What would Tim want us to do? Would he want this band to fall apart? We didn't, I don't think so. So we're going to take whatever time we need to process this whole thing and heal. And then we got to get back to it because Tim was a lifer musician. 
And he was the oldest in the band, and he'd been doing it the longest, and we were just absolutely sure that that's what he would want. It was a terrible accident, but accidents happen, and we were totally supported by the entirety of the Atlanta music yeah. scene. It was amazing, and uh, it was just kind of one of those things like, what else are you going to do? We just got to get through it and, you know, our our next drummer was Theron Peterson, who happened to have been almost like a student, young guy of Tim's. They were really good friends. They hung out a lot. Tim was like Theron's mentor. And uh, I went and saw him play. We taught... We, talked about it and I just knew this is this is where it's going to go this is what Tim would want he would be happy it's a good fit and like that and and it just things kind of come together you got to follow your gut do what what feels right and to this day Theron just did a, a gig with me filled in that was 12, 13 years ago. And uh, I still know Theron. He did a gig with us. He, I worked it out with Tim's family and Theron bought Tim's drums after the accident from Tim's family. And he still has them. He played them. You probably saw it. I took a picture of the drum kit and like posted yeah. it online. Like, here's the, here's these drums still out there. Yeah. You know, I mean, those those add to the whole, that add to what you're doing, these experiences. And uh, I don't know, man. We don't really talk about it all that much, but I'll, I never forget it. I'm still in touch with Tim's daughter. Uh, she was a kid then. She's grown now, but she's come out and seen us play, and she has kids of her own now. And I don't know, man. You just... Keep it together. Keep it together and do what's right at the time. And that's... That's a that's a strong core. We we talked earlier. Um, uh, thank you for sharing that story. I know you don't talk about it a lot. No, I, you know, I don't, but I, I still deal with it all the time because, you know, I made promises to myself and Tim... And his daughter, who I never met at the time, I just knew that she existed. I'm, an, you know, Tim was a classic drummer. He'd been doing it his whole life. You know, he his he'd never. I got to think about what I can, what I want to share. But he had a daughter. He was never married to her mom. And her mom and Tim did not get along. But Tim loved his daughter. But he was in one of these situations that are becoming all more common where he loved his daughter and he wanted to be a part of her life, but he did not get along with her mom and there was constant friction. It happened to be at the, around the same time that I was about to have my first kid. And so we were always talking about kids and all this like that. So I know exactly where his daughter was in his life, where he would have liked her to have been in his life and all that stuff like that. So when this happened, suddenly I found myself dealing with his young daughter and his daughter's mother. And I, it was not easy because there was, you'd alternate between there's this kid who just lost her father and then here's a mom who doesn't always have the greatest things to say about this, you know, and, Somewhere, we again, coming back to the community and everybody helping out, I found it within me how to deal with it. And, you know, I don't know, man. I made a, I told myself, I'm going to do right in whatever way I can for Tim, by Tim and his daughter. And uh, I haven't talked to her mom, but now she's grown and I've talked to her. She's come out to gigs and, you know, we talked about it a little bit. Like, 
she knows, this is kind of weird. I don't want to make it about me, but she knows I did everything I could as a bandmate. You know, I can't fix what happened, what, what went on in your family, but I can tell you, you were a kid then, you're an adult now, how your dad felt about you because he talked about you all the time. And, you know, and sh she kind of made, has made peace with that. And she, every, the, on the occasion that I do see her, because she lives out in Covington, you know, her, she's f filling in the, that puzzle of who was her dad. Because, you know, we all, none of us can remember things when we were right. 11, 12. But it's, it's an extension of her dad. She's getting yeah. to see a big piece of her dad even now when she comes out. And yeah, sees you guys, and that's it's a responsibility that I don't I don't know if everybody could carry it, but you know I don't know, man. It's part of the whole thing. I you know it's more than just the music. Uh, I I hope I did right by her, and uh, I don't. Nobody should have to deal with that stuff. Mm, but, yeah, but nope. you do, and <laughs> and, and you it happens. It seems like it one, once a year. It happens. It happens. Yeah. You know, How many times we all play benefits for you know, some tragedy that happened as a musician, you know? And uh, I've been a part of a couple of them that were for either for me or something for the band. And what goes around comes around. Uh, you know, man. Mm. I know. It's tough. Yeah. It's a tough one. Well, that's good. I, I, I am, I'm glad you kept in touch. With the daughter, yeah, I know that means a lot to her. Cool that his student took over his spot in the band. Yep, and yep. did all that. So, man, there's a lot of stuff. This this band, I guess, any band that was been around for not only for 20 years, but the age we started, we were all in our early 20s, and and you know, I could just keep on giving you these little tidbits of the evolution. Anybody, when you know anybody for 20 years, you're part of chunk of their lives and you're in on it so like that drummer that we're talking about that happened he was a young guy and he got those drums and he played and then we went to Europe and he met a girl in Europe and then we came back and he kept in touch with that girl and then she was in Europe but she was from South Africa then he went to South Africa and they got married and now they live at back they're back in Georgia and they are a married couple couple you know i mean i if you go around long enough time and some of these people you know we've had people get we i've seen band members get married band, band members end marriages I've seen band members have kids and i've seen fans get married you know they were dating when we first met them and they're married now i mean like you know it can become pretty you step back and you're like, wow, I've been a witness at minimum, a witness to some pretty cool events in people's lives, you know, just by providing, playing music that they liked. I take that, maybe I take it too seriously, but when somebody calls my barroom blues band and says, well, you guys want to come play our wedding? Yeah, that's cool. Yeah. You know, like most bands... They're like, wedding has got to be the worst gig in the world. I don't think so. Again, I don't promote myself as a wedding band. So as many weddings as we've done, I've never done a wedding for somebody that didn't know our band and wasn't a fan. They didn't just look into a list of bands. Yeah, and, pick you out of a catalog. Pick you out of a catalog. Yeah, well, that means something. So then there's something different. You know, we're not just the wedding band. There's usually some connection. When well, we've been seeing you guys, and again, it's about a lot of it comes back to that very special place, Northside Tavern. We've been seeing you guys at Northside Tavern for years. When we were dating, we used to go out and see you guys, and uh, it would just be awesome to have you there. And you're just like, man, that's a big deal. I think it is. Yeah, no, you know? it's a huge, it's yeah. huge deal, and you're a part of kind of the lore of someone's life, and. Um, and that's, I mean, to, to be asked as a fan for you to do their wedding, I think that's a huge honor. I think it speaks to consistency. When you go see the Breeze Kings at Northside Tavern, A, Northside Tavern hasn't changed much nope. over the years, if at all. 
And then, um, and you know exactly what you're going to get. Every Thursday and night. that's, let's bring it back around to, a, to the band thing. So there's another thing that I really think is important. You know, there's a lot of bands out there that it's the so-and-so band, the John Doe band, the, J the John Smith band. And that band is going to be John Smith and whoever he got that night to play with him. This happens a lot in blues. Of a lot of the great bands that we remember, that we grew up on, you can name every member of the band. Mm -hmm. Now, in our current musical tastes of our culture, you know the front person of the band. You don't know who's in the band. And if you go see them live, it won't be the same band the next time you see them live or the next time you see them live. It doesn't matter the genre. But I see that a lot. And I don't dig it. It happens. you got to deal with it. But band members do change from time to time. But I, I think it's important that people get to know the band and the players and the sound. They all contribute. And uh, early on, it was discussed. Do we call this Carlos and the Breeze Kings? No. No, that was going to be my next question. No, we do not. This is the band. And when you hire this band, for the most part, you know who's showing up. You know who's going to be there. As best as I can do that. We are, again, you're still a working level band and there's conflicts and you have to have a substitution here and there from time to time. But for the most part, the band is these guys, and that's who's going to be there. And I think that's a that's a, a lost part of music that's kind of going away. Um, still, yeah, the, I mean, it's hard to retain band members. It, it is hard to retain, hard especially to make at our money. level. Yeah, especially at our level. If if you're working and you've got some steady, it's a whole lot easier. When you're not working, yeah, it's but I, difficult. It's worked in our favor. Right. Because we have been able to maintain that, whether it be with the, the number of gigs or the situations that guys are in. Like I said, a little bit of intention and a little bit of luck came together. I always, I always want to keep a steady band. I try as hard as I can to, to put, to do the things that are necessary to keep a steady band, and then I'm lucky that it worked. Yeah. You know what I mean? Like you can't help if somebody moves or does this or does that. And it's happened. But I think that helps. I I really do. Because you might have a fan that's a fan not necessarily of me, but they are a big fan of that guitar player because they're a guitar player themselves and they like the style that person plays or that drummer or that bass player. Man, I love to go see the bass the the, this band X because they got the funkiest bass player and I've been playing bass and I love the dude's sound. Well, if they go see band X and it's not that bass player that night, yeah, they're disappointed. Yeah, And that's, that's, that's probably uh, more of the scene. I depends. Mean, that's more than I, not at that. Happens. Yeah. And, and it's not necessarily a bad thing. I'm not going to put down people like there are people that you go specifically to hear that front person. You want to hear them sing. You want to hear their original songs. You want to hear their, stuff it's a lot of weight when it's a lot of weight on that front person when they when they sell it that way you're coming to see me i'm john the john smith band and you're going to come see john smith and i'm going to give you the john smith show that you want no matter who's playing behind me because i'm we're going to be rehearsed they're going to know my material and they're going to play it well but i'm going to play the solos i'm going to infuse the music with the passion and the stuff that you're hoping to hear. And that obviously can be done very well and it works. But, you know, it's, I, I'm going back to a right. time where people knew every member of the band. So let's talk about your current lineup. <clears throat> All right. And before we get to the current, current lineup, okay. 
let's go back to um so when we end this I'll, I'll talk about how our paths diverged right we started with the exact same people i just did it about 10 years earlier <laughs> <laughs> right and jim was one of them uh that urban shake dancers back in my drummer days when i was a drummer i'd play with the shake dancers and um so Jim was a guitar player. Right. So Jim now joins your band and is in your band for 20 years? Mm-hmm. Yeah. First off. So what, except uh, for the first three, October, November, and December, it was not Jim. It was my buddy who was my roommate and a very close friend at the time. But like I said, when we first put this particular band together, everybody was playing in other bands. Yep. And at month three, we nev- we still never thought it was going to take off beyond Thursdays. So his priority was to the other band. And when the other band got a Thursday night gig, he had to go with the other band. So he didn't quit. I didn't fire him. Nobody. It was just like, sorry, man, my band, my real band, my number one band yeah. got a conflicting gig. And got to do what you got to do. Serendipity, like Jim and I hooked up and it worked. Um, and he didn't, he didn't have other obligations musically and I was get, getting to the point where I like this I like the band where I'm choosing the music and I'm getting comfortable now it's four months in five months in I'm getting more comfortable being up front and we are choosing the music together instead of the other band leader telling me what we're going to play and this and that and so I was willing to let the other project go I told him, man, man I, I want to put my all, I want to put my efforts all into this band and I'm still friends with all those people. Uh, so, you know, it worked at first. It was a little shaky. Hey, I booked a gig on Friday. Sorry. You know, for, uh, Dave and Joe, our rhythm section, because they did still have other projects, yeah. but the more I was getting and the more it was gelling, it just naturally everybody started saying, "Yeah, you know, I'm gonna I'm gonna drop that other thing. I won't do that one." So you, so you, so so that core group was together for five years. All everybody is gonna remember when they watch this is the dude burped like five times. <laughs> like, what am I doing? <laughs> drinking soda? Dude, we'll while I'm we'll doing fix it. it in post. We'll <laughs> fix it in the mix. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, so that group, man, and we were tight, and we played a lot, and we were gung ho. And uh, and we just had a lot of fun. We're young enough to do all the stupid stuff that young bands do, but we had enough natural energy to plow right. through all the dumb stuff and still do the gigs and still power through it. And I was still able to get up and go to work the next morning and, uh, you know, and make stuff happen and uh then we switched and you you know these guys so i can't go through all the drummers no no so really right now i'm just thinking about jim and then your last iteration because i know i know but but jim is the was the longest tenured member of the band like tenured yeah 20 years well it was like i said so it was three months with mark 20 years with jim and now it's been whatever, six or seven months with Lee. Right. Now, Lee has been around f- forever. Forever. Yeah. Fronting his own bands, playing with everybody. Lee was like a mentor for me. When I was first started getting with the band, Lee was playing clubs, but what I noticed that Lee and a few other guys were doing was they were doing a lot of private events. And I'm like, why is everybody fighting tooth and nail to get these few club gigs out there? when there's private events, when there are weddings and corporate events and company events and backyard parties and this and stuff like that, for some reason, there's a stigma for certain bands on doing those types of things. I don't have that. It's work. As long as I'm still, you're hiring me for the show that I put on and I'm playing the music that I play. I'm not changing my show for you. So whether I do it at uh, Northside Tavern or Blind Willies, or if I do the same show at uh, the Westin Hotel for your company, 
uh, spring party and you want to have a blues and barbecue themed company party, I will come and play some blues for you. And But you're not playing pina colada. I'm not. Yeah, I'm doing the same. Unless unless you're show. unless you're with me, <laughs> unless but, you're backing me, right? But you know, I don't. I don't. I mean, I still love all that music. But I mean, I, again, it's about. Is it fair to say it's branding? Like, if you hire the Breeze Kings, you're gonna get a blues band. If you want a different type of music, ask me. I got buddies all over town. I'll find you the guy that right. will play. If you want a reggae band or you want a real traditional jazz band or a classic rock band. I know the guys, but if you want a blues band, we're the band. And not a lot of bands wanted to do that kind of stuff. They thought if you aren't on a stage in a bar, then it's not legit. Yeah. Well, well, I have a well, different that, habit. I'm like, that's people that aren't putting kids through college and that aren't putting bread. On my the thing is it's legit. If you're getting paid to do what you do. And if you're able to keep um, your core values right. as far as the music you want to play and, and who you are. As long as you're not compromising yourself, yeah, there's yeah. absolutely no problem with it. But <clears throat> some people, it's called jealousy for starters. Whatever it and, is. You know, so I noticed, but what I was getting at is that Lee was doing a lot of that stuff. So I used to talk to him like, man, what do you, and he said, well, you know, if you want some of the things, him, Mike Veal was another one. You got to have, if you're going to get into that arena, you got to do things a little different. When you start doing private events like that, you're dealing with contracts and timetables and wedding coordinators and this person. And you've got to pro up your game. You know, it's not just showing up at a bar and cranking it out. You've got to pro up your presentation. Yep. You're selling it. And uh, those guys guided me along a lot of that. So the point is that I'd known Lee forever. And he was a mentor and a friend and a great player. And so it just worked out that when Jim decided he was he was going to go, Lee was kind of not doing a lot. And I was ta I really just called him and said, hey, can you fill in here and there for me for the next few months while I find a new guy? And he's like, am I a candidate? And I was like, I guess if you want to be a candidate, you know, I didn't really think that you've been having your own band for the whole time I've known you, 25 years, you had the Lee Griffin band. I didn't think you'd want to be a member of the Breeze Kings. And uh, he was like, hell yeah, I want to be a member of the Breeze Kings. Yeah, why not? You know? You did. Uh, and so that was not only a nice little boost to me, but I was like, well, that takes care of that whole, like the whole <laughs> nightmare of having... Uh, tryouts and all that stuff just kind of washed away in one phone call. You know, so the first show I saw you play with Lee was the uh, greatest night Matilda's had ever had. Yeah. You know, and it was a great show. I mean, Lee's, Lee's a, Lee's, Lee's a heck of a killer player. guitar player. Yeah. And he had filled in with us so much. He already had a pretty good foundation in a lot of our material. So, you know what, we just had to do a few rehearsals and do some gigs and just, obviously, whenever you change a band member, certain little feels are going to change, you know, stylistically. But we just, you know, there's no lack of professionalism or skill there. So, man, it just worked out. It just worked out. So we got we got Carlos Capote. So that's those are the easy ones. Yeah, the Carlos guitar Capote and Lee. It's always Wait. been me on harmonic and vocals, yep. and only minimal guitar changes. And we got Lee, and then on the drums now we, we have, have Trevor. Trevor, who's been with Trevor Roberts, who's been with us now about six years. Here, it's not that's not his full name though. It's it's Trevor Tre the Nature Boy. It's Trevor, woo, Roberts. Woo! <laughs> He's not gonna like that if he sees that. Uh, Trevor is an enthusiast. For the, the great Ric Flair, but I think he's decided that I laid on a little thick. A little thick, <laughs> but how could I not? So Trevor's been with us about six years, and uh, what's his great. background? Trevor is was music. Is I mean, he came up high school marching band. He did. I don't know. I'm not versed in the marching band scene. 
but apparently he toured the country and was in the highest levels of marching band. Like the heavy duty stuff like yeah. you see, you know, he went up to New York and out to, you know, and really big stuff. And uh, so he has been in drums since he was a kid and doing the marching band thing, but then picked up, started playing in jazz and bands and stuff like that. And again, we met him for a small period of time. We, he barely remembers it. We were running a jam up in Marietta for a short period of time. And he was coming to the jam to meet other people. That's what you got to do when you're trying to yeah. get yourself out there. And I remember we met him and uh, never f forgot who he was, but just one of the guys that came to our jam, but he was always around. He was playing with a couple other bands, and uh, we had a point where we were looking for a drummer, and we tried a bunch of guys, and he's the one that felt right. Uh, previous him would say, let's real quick, we'll say Joe Caprera, and then there was Mark Yarbrough for a number of years. I don't think you ever met Mark. Um, and Tim Gunther, uh, and then Theron, who we've mentioned all those guys. And then we had a little bit of a lot of a couple period there where Jack Jones played with us for a little while, and a good friend named Jeff Hudis played with us for a while, and Country Bill Edwards played with us for another, a while. Another, another shake, shake dancer. dancer. I mean, all part of the family. Yep. And uh but those guys all had things going on in their lives. Um, Hudis has moved out to Seattle. Country Bill's in St. Louis. And uh, Jack Jones had moved to New Orleans, and now he's back. And then, um, so we had a little bit of a, of a fluctuation, and then we got Terrence Prather. And Terrence Prather was with us for a long time. And, uh, and then after Terrence... I don't think I'm missing anybody. Was we had a couple months where we were trying a lot of different guys, and we got Theron, and Theron's been with us since then. And the bass player situation is very similar. We had Dave Roth, and then we had Matt Sickles for a long time. Another old friend going all the way back, you know, to the your days, all the guys you went to school with, and uh, then we had Aaron Trubick. And Aaron Trubick is the one that, when he left, he suggested Greg Shapiro. Our buddy Greg Shapiro. Our buddy Greg Shapiro. And Greg had just finished playing with Sonia Lee on Zach Brown's label and all that's like that. And uh, I wasn't so sure because Greg was probably officially the first guy that I was given a shot that really didn't have any kind of blues background. He didn't. He had never played in any band that I knew right. personally. He was. He wasn't a staple in the blues. Scene He's in, really yeah. Uh, obviously, Greg knows everybody. Everybody knows him for what he did. It was, but you know, I I I kind of stayed in my pond of players because I I'm Jim and I were so steeped in the traditional music. We kind of wanted people that were hip to it. But everybody that knew Greg assured us. Greg's your guy, and Greg is a great dude, and we got along with him great, and he was immediately listen, willing to listen to and want to get what made this band tick, what made this band a little bit stand out from the long list of blues bands around town. You know, blues is such a, easily thrown around word there's a lot of bands that will say oh we play a mix of kind of <laughs> blues and rock and this and they love to throw that blues word out there and uh you know i don't mind saying i am a blues purist i am a traditionalist i am a card carrying member of the blues police if you're going to throw that word blues around as a descriptor of your band come on well you don't guys you are that's a great, that's the way I would describe you. Yeah. Very traditional blues band. Yeah. Through Because well, we love it. We, yeah. I mean, we honestly, we come by it as honestly and as authentically as we do. Like, 
that is what I listen to when I go home. That's what I have on my phone. That's what I love to listen to. I'm not playing it because I can or because there's bars out there that will book blues bands or whatever. You know, everybody loves blues. If you play it reasonably well, blues has such a universal appeal, you know? And so it's a great music to have in music venues. If you do a decent job, I've never heard anybody say, man, I just, I just don't like this music. It's, it's, it hits the core of people. So a lot of bands like to add that to their descriptors. Oh, you know, we kind of play some blues and rock and it's a stretch to so a purist like me. I'm it's like, a rock well, I hear, band playing I hear a lot of rock, songs. Yeah. but I don't hear a lot of blues. It's, it's, you a, know? it's a rock band playing blues songs. Is what it I'm is. not the judge and jury of except of what I like, but I've been doing it a while and I've done my homework and I really, you know, I, 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 I don't, you know, without putting people down, it's like if the extent of your blues uh, resume is a Jimi Hendrix song and maybe a Stevie Ray Vaughan song. I'm not taking away from those names. They're on the mountaintop. But you just, you're, you haven't dug very deep. You're, it's right. kind of shallow. It's like right. saying you're a, a reggae band because you do a couple of Bob Marley's hits and then you play whatever you want after that. You know what I mean? Or you're, you know, a jazz band because you guys have figured out one Miles Davis tune and then you play whatever you want after right. that. Uh, so there was a little bit of trepidation with Greg, except what he didn't, he wasn't in all that, but he dove right in. He was willing to take like, man, let's, you know, I'll get some music guitar. Let's pull this back. Let's fatten it up. Let's listen to this. Hey, can I give you some CDs? And, you know, Greg is just a super versatile player that appreciates the music. He's into a lot of the stuff that came from blues, you know, and uh, he just turned out to be a great guy and a great player. Yep. And of course, you knew Greg, so that's where <laughs> no, we I meet. I knew Greg, and that's where uh, we from, meet. Right from the get-go, when Greg joined the band, and Greg's been with us now for the last five years, once every few months, he would be like, hey, uh, write this down on your calendar. I, I'm booked on this date. I got a gig with my buddy, Glenn Pritchett. All right. And, you know, there was more than one gig where I booked something on that night, and I just used another bass player. And... uh as it happens. And then I don't know what happened on your end, but at one point, Greg said, Hey, Glenn needs more than just me. He needs more. You guys, if you guys all want to go do a couple rehearsals with Glenn and learn his material, I'm sure you guys would all dig it. It's real Southern rock and roll oriented. We can all do these shows. And it worked out, man. You did, know, we yeah. all, so we did some, we did your show, your, learn your songs and we all get along again. To me, that's it. If, if you had turned out to be a jerk off, <laughs> then that wouldn't have happened. Right. You know what I mean? But you're, you're part of the family without, without, even though I had never met you, we talked for five minutes and realized we have all these friends yeah, in the same tree. and all the tree, yep. you know, like that. And so one of my favorite things about Atlanta and the music scene is that there is that deep, long family. And you were in it. We were just kind of on our opposite sides of the bush, so, but, you know. Yeah. So I go back. I'll, I'll tell you where I came from. I, 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 uh, my my I had one blues record when I was younger, and that was uh, I bought it because Chris Galore, who's the leader of the Last yep, Waltz yep. Ensemble, um, we went to high school together. We actually danced at Teen Club Packets together when we were fifteen. So we go way back. But he, I, I said, "What blues record do I get?" And he said, "BB King Live at Cook County Jail." And bought it, and I've played that thing. A million I'm glad times. you said Live at Cook County Jail. And we can have a little tangent because I will go to my grave arguing with everybody that I would rather listen to live at Cook County Jail than live at the Regal. And I 
If we had a phone call to call in, there'd right now there'd be a bunch of blues purists calling me and saying that I just blasphemed <laughs> that Live at the Regal is on, you know, one of the considered one of the top blues albums of all time, certainly one of the greatest live albums. And I'm not taking away from Live at the Regal. But I think there's more to it. I just love Live at Cook County Jail. Maybe it's the the image of him actually playing at a jail for prisoners that that I just think is amazing. The the energy of that record. I love it. Is everything about that record. The I energy, the sound, the engineering, the mixing, the playing, everything yeah. for me worked. And I, I still listen to it all the time. Mm-hmm. I still listen to it. So so it came from watching my dad play uh, around Atlanta, Felix. Before mm-hmm. there was Felix and the Cats, they had a, a steady at Blind Willie's with lots of Papa. Mm-hmm. So watching my dad with lots of Papa, watching my dad play kind of around town, Rick Hinkle and him did See, a bunch crazy. of stuff. See, it's crazy. And that's what I'm saying, our, our trees. Because you're talking about Felix and the Cats, who was one of the first live bands that I saw when I first started going out to see blues. when They were playing... At Fat Matt's really regular. And you're talking about Lots of Papa. Lee Griffin played with Lots of Papa for years. And my dad. They and, played right, they a play, bunch of shows and, together. And, you know, Rick, every name, it's like funny that you and I hadn't known each other, but every name that you come up with, whether it be Paul Linden or Chris Jelly yeah. or all these people, David Fish, all these guys you went to school with, they were, they were all people that I had known. So somehow, even though we were... Sort of Swimming parallel, in the same yeah. Same river, we weren't within eye shot of each other. Right. It's crazy cool. how that works, yeah. isn't it? So, um, yeah, and Urban Shake Dancers. I ran, I took a, a sound gig, uh, running sound for a, a club. Oh, God. So the, the first club was, oh, I'm going to forget the name of it. Uh, Robbie was the owner. Maybe that'll get it. Okay. I, I'll come up with the name, but it was the club before Lil Elmo's Blues Parlor. And in that this club, uh, Stony Brooks had a blues jam. So every I think Tuesday night, no, I don't. I think Stony was Wednesday or Thursday. Every Tuesday was the Shake Dancers. So I would run sound. I would play drums with the band, and I watched them. I watched Robert Page go from you know hair down the middle of I his back. Rem- I think one of their first steady gigs was Spring Break. I don't know if that's the one you're talking about. They had a few, but the a Blue Iguana. That's the name Blue of the club. Iguana. So this is the Blue Iguana. He, yeah, they had Wally T and Arrow mm-hmm. and saxophone at the time before they really tightened up. I mean, they went uh, uh, they went from a, a good band to a uh oh okay this is the, this is a big deal. Yeah. I mean, they exploded mm-hmm. on the scene. Um, great guys, Jim, huge part of the band. Yep. So um, yeah, I mean, so background, all those guys, Stony Brooks. Uh, Grady Fats Jackson, when he was around. So all of my blues came live. And it's really hard for me to find records that work for me um, that capture the spirit and the energy that, that live does. So for blues for me, when I want I want to solve my blues Jones, I, I go Northside Tavern. I, I catch live bands wherever I can. Right. Um, I'm trying to get better. We, we were talking about my record collection. And, yep. I, and I, I have one. I have live at Cook County Jail, and that's it. So I, I got to do a little better than that. And uh, actually, I have a Howlin' Wolf. Than a bar, which we'll talk about in a sec. So Greg and I, Greg was one of the guys that when I went through my rehab, drug rehab phase, and came out of that, and he really kind of pushed me into playing, helped me put together my first, you know, sort of comeback band, um, and got me back in the scene. And, and he always said, Breeze Kings, man, you got to get the Breeze Kings, got to get the Breeze Kings. And... So it worked out. We had a show. You guys are available, and, and we did it. And yeah, right from the first practice, it was just like, man, this works. Uh, and you're you're playing with a band that's already got yeah, already togetherness, gelled. you know. And what I liked was I liked the contrast. So I mean, my dad was a, a blues guy, jazz guy. We, mm-hmm. Half the songs we played were his. So they're se- songs from the '70s, right. rock and roll songs. But I like putting together. A, it was a very traditional blues band playing. Southernish rock mm-hmm. type songs, and it just it brought in a whole new dimension. It, the songs took a whole different turn and was rich. And we've we've done some really good shows. The best show we I think we ever did was when we really broke it down at the Atlanta Room at Smith's Old Bar. You remember that show? Mm-hmm. And it was brushes, and we broke it down. And man, it was yeah. We, so it worked, and it's it's fun. I hope we can play together again. 
I, I have been working on records and, and doing mm-hmm. other stuff, but I'm, I'm hoping uh, next year that I get back out and start playing again. But it, it, it's been a blast. But um, my daughter, who sang, sang with me, yep. and, and uh, you know, one of her comments was, wow, everybody uh, that you play with are great people. And and I, I second what you say. It's got to be. It's got to be great people. It's got to be. It's got to be. And <laughs> luck, for sure. I've I've often said like my timing was lucky, but I love Atlanta's music scene. I love it. I'd be afraid if I had to. If circumstances had me moving somewhere, you know. I like to think by now I've got enough notches in my belt. I could as- I could get something going in another town. I could play music. I'd find the right guys. Uh, my reputation would hopefully give me a little kickstart. But I just don't know if I could put together or find the community. I mean, I've now, not, all, not just a band, but so many of the friendships that I have in the mu- Atlanta music scene are 20 plus years old. I mean, they're just good people. And you're not the first one to say something like that. My uh, my wife has said it. Jim's wife said it. Like, made the comments like, this is just, as, as she meets more and more people in the scene, she's like, there's no assholes. Sure, this person's got a little streak here. He's got a little streak here, you know. But the core people, she's like, it's good people, fun people, smart people, caring people. That it's just amazing, you know. I'm, I'm always blown away by the caliber of people. We can go back to the beginning of what we talked about, like whether or not they're always up to the business of a band or something like that. Yeah, not every musician's going to be a band leader. Not every musician's going to be great at time management yeah. or, you know, balancing his Correct checkbook. <laughs> at balancing his checkbook. But, man, good people. For to, to boil it down to two words, every one of these people, I just, at their core, are good, caring people, and you Take them for what they're worth. You know, if you need help from Greg Shapiro, he's going to come help you. He'll be late. (laughs) He'll be late. You know. But he's there. But he'll be there. Uh, Absolutely. We use his name because he's our connecting link. But, you know, that can be anything. Stony Brooks. You know, Stony Brooks, man. He, for my, my ascension, and that was the wrong word, Stony Brooks is the guy, one of the guys that that I told you, I used to go to the jams and I would ask questions. Great harmonica player here in Atlanta, been around forever. And I would ask him questions. Like, what do you think of this? How can I do that? And we'd be out in the parking lot of the club and I'd play a little bit. And he's the one that said, I'm listening to you play. It's about time for you to get up at the jam. You don't need to just be showing up at the jam to listen and ask questions. You need to be partaking. And he was really big on that. And then, of course, the one time I finally got the guts to get up at the jam, he wasn't there. But coincidentally, so that jam was on a Monday. I went to see his band like I always did, and I think it was either a Friday or Saturday. And he's like, I heard you finally got up at the jam, and I heard you did good. Well, guess what? Tonight you're getting up on stage on a (laughs) Friday night in front of a Stony, a big crowd, and he pulled me up. So, you know, all these people. He named the band. He yanked me on stage in front of a capacity crowd. I almost left. I was so afraid when he told me, "You're going to get up next set and do a couple songs." I was going to leave. I was just going to get in my car and drive away, but I was afraid that I'd let him down. Like, I didn't want to do it. Yeah. I didn't know how to tell him no. And I was like, you know, I'm going to leave. And then I thought, man, that's, that's that's high school bullshit. What do I do? I can't just leave. He's giving, he's, he's trying to do, and it was a dilemma, man. I was 
shaken and upset. And I was upset. I don't want to get up on stage and place this pack, but I had to do it. And I, years later, I got to, I got to give him all that credit for that, you know? And then, so the other guy that I played with from time to time a lot in those early days before the Breeze Kings was Mudcat. So when I played- Same thing. Mudcat was at all, uh, early on with Mudcat. Same thing. Uh, when I played at the jam on Monday and then with Stoney on Saturday, the next week at the jam, Mudcat was there and I used to, I used to go see Mudcat all the time. Mudcat, Stoney, and a couple others- were my regular rotation of bands wherever they were playing. So I'd gotten to know them, and he was like, hey, man, I've heard you got on stage at the jam and then with Stoney this past weekend. Yeah, and he's like, he had the regular Wednesday night slot. He's been at Northside Tavern about three years longer than yeah. me. And uh, he's like, come by on Wednesday and play with me. And Mudcat style on Wednesday is like what I told you I originally liked. It's the acoustic yep. sit down, me and Mudcat. And... That began a long friendship of Mudcat and I playing on Wednesdays and him taking me out on the road with him to do some really cool gigs and playing in the Mudcat band for a long time. That's the band that I first ever sang a song with. Really? Mudcat was? Mudcat. Nice. You know, I mean, just kind of weird things. He's the one that came up called me Breeze, like a cool breeze, you know, I don't remember exactly how he did, but it just, it just happened, you know, and man, I don't know if I could create all these beautifully organic connections and growth that happened for me. Yeah. You know? Mudcat is one of the few people that it can just be him and a guitar, and I, I, I never look away, I never get bored. Yep. I mean, he's 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 entertaining. He's that good. He's good, he's that charismatic. But he's got he's got. He comes uh, from a theater background. Does he? Yeah, I did not know that. He's got yep. the sauce, man. He's got all all the extra stuff. He's full of that blues flavor. That it's just. Yep. Yeah, I, I haven't seen him in a while. I need to I need to get by and check him out again. Love my cat. It's re really really good. And I mean, like I said, I don't. It's great timing. I've now that I've been in this scene for as long as I have. I haven't seen, it's still there, it's still healthy, but it's more crowded, it's more spread out. Like, my timing through no action of my own was just perfect. You know what I mean? It was perfect to come in when the scene was more concentrated and only, you only had to be visible in a few places to meet everybody. Yeah. And... uh and the s certain key people, part of, you know, blues is a really traditional music. And you gotta, you gotta unlock the doors. The doors aren't always open. You gotta show, I believe, because I do this myself, you gotta show real, genuine enthusiasm and interest if you want one of the veterans to open up their playbook for you, yeah. to show you some things, to give you a little insight. Uh, otherwise, you're just another joker in the bar going, hey, man, you play really good guitar. Can you play me some <laughs> Jimi Hendrix? Or, you know, somebody asking me, you guys are a blues band. You play harmonic. You play me some blues traveler. You know, <laughs> happens all the time. And I, I know it comes from a good place. I make fun, but I know anybody that asks oh. for a song, it comes from a good place. Right. They are enjoying the show, and they want to connect with you further by having you do a song that they're familiar with and that they like. They're just not making the connection that nothing that you've heard play tonight should have given you the <laughs> should I idea that I play Blues Traveler, <laughs> except for a big guy playing harmonica. But, you know... These guys, when I would go up and ask them a question, like sometimes people ask me questions about harmonica. I always start off with a pleasant answer. I answer the questions or whatever. It's not until the fourth or fifth question where I realize this is just somebody who's had a few drinks and they are enamored with that little box of shiny things that I have in front of me. Yeah, not, 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 not or, a... 
they really want to know because they're trying to learn and they've, right. they've already done some of it, but they've hit a sticking point and they're trying to figure out. And if you prove through your questions and your enthusiasm that you really want to know, and it's important, then I'll, I'll go outside and I'll, I'll talk with you. I'll give you my phone number. Call me up. Yeah, man. Let's, you know, and I think it's that way again. I, I think that's very unique to the blues very scene unique. as well. It's like oh. almost an unofficial apprenticeship, but you got to prove your worth. You, you know, if you're a kid that wants to learn how to, you know, this again, it's traditional it goes back the old, the apprentice, the, the apprentice carpenter, the apprentice blacksmith or the apprentice, whatever. If you wanted to learn from, a master, and I use that word lightly, it doesn't mean that I have, I am a master. I learn from people that have been doing it a long time, and they were masters to me, and if I can ever be some a teacher to somebody else, I'd be happy to do it. But I don't, I'm not, I have, don't want to waste my time. Right. So, like, you have to somehow pass through that filter of, are you one of the time wasters? Because then I'm just going to give you the friendly answer. Yeah, I play in this many keys, and we do a thing called cross harp or whatever. And yeah, oh, you want to know what brand? Yeah, go buy a Honer harmonica. Thanks, man. Glad you came to the show. <laughs> but if you really want to sit down and talk about some of the nuance, and I think you're sincere, then we then I'm happy to do it. But you know, just the same thing. You don't get to just walk in to uh, you know, a master carpenter's shop and say, hey, can you teach me, teach me how to do this stuff like that? And he's going to be like, no, it doesn't work yeah, that way. It, but it, if you prove that you are committed, this is what you want to do, you may earn that that thing. And I I don't know how that develops, but I, I see it as a thing that comes in the traditional types of music, blues, jazz, bluegrass. You know, because they are not mainstream, you get, let's go right back to how we started. You get bit by the bug. And if you show the veteran, someone who remembers when they got bit by the bug, yeah. that you're bit and you're in it, good or for better or for worse, now they're going to teach you how to <laughs> how to live with this ailment that you've been stricken <laughs> with, you know, because they remember, you know. And uh, those guys come along. I see them now. There's a couple young guys on the scene that I, you know, will fondly think, man, that was me. Some yeah, something, time ago. someone to hand it off to. Yeah. It, it, that's what you always hope. You always yeah. hope that you've inspired enough when someone comes in and, and they've got that bug mm -hmm. that that what you do can live on. Yeah, and, I think and, that's and you just kind of nudge. You just give a little direction. Yeah. Hey, try that because I, you know, a lot of times all the stuff we've talked about, what I find myself just as often talking about to guys that are trying to come up is all the other stuff that we talked about. Man, listen to the music. Dive into the deep end of the musical pool and swim in it deep, deep. But this isn't funsies. You got to have your shit together. You know, and that's what I find a lot of guys like, man, find guys that you can play with or Find your material. You can't get out there and just do the same set that another band is doing or whatever. Find your thing. And, you know, I've given a lot of advice to guys about that guy. That might not be a long-term band member. You know what I've always wanted to do? Always wanted to do this. I've always wanted to open up for a band, mid-level band, you mm -hmm. know, maybe a, maybe a mid-level Smith's Bar band. And then uh, immediately tribute the set they're about to play, <laughs> and play it, play it as a tribute act, and then leave them. Hey to play man, the same I've songs. seen it happen. I've seen, you know, I've been the multi-band bill and been the next band up, and then heard a band do a song that I was going to do, and you got to got to be able to adjust. Yeah. But then, how many times? I mean, we both know bands. That's, you know, there's just I've seen bands that they know eight songs. They don't have enough repertoire to swap out. All right, we're going to take that one out and put this one in. You know? No. Uh, I've, I see that all the time. 
that's another part of the blues deal and maybe like some of the rock deal. Like, I, it's been a while. I, if, if I get a, a one set show, 75 minutes or something like that, man, I'm, I'm barely getting warmed up. I mean, I'm just used to it. Trial of three sets, lots of material, yeah. 30 or 40 songs, you know, and, uh, and of course, when you're doing them over and over in the same town, you got to be adding new material. You can have a band that goes on tour across the country and they play the same 90 minute set front to back song for song the whole time because nobody heard them the week before. But, uh, yeah, that's tough. With a steady, yeah. you cannot do that. So let's talk about you guys are, outside of being incredibly consistent, you guys, um, and I've been proud to be a part of it the last five years, I think, um, probably most well-known for yeah. Howling, Howling Wolf, the Wolf Fest. Well, yeah, like I told you, and it really it was a happy joke, but when we the fir- original lineup of the band, three of us, myself, Jim, and Dave, kind of came to the realization that we, the three of us, were Howlin' Wolf nuts. We just all loved Howlin' Wolf. And so we kept on adding Howlin' Wolf tunes to our to our repertoire. And it got to the point where it was almost kind of like funny. We were doing 10 Howlin' Wolf, 12 songs a night. And so I don't remember what year the first one was, but we basically were like, it was in the early 2000s, we're like, do you think we could actually do Howlin' Wolf tunes all night? Just a whole show of nothing but Howlin' Wolf tunes? And we kind of thought, yeah, we could do it. But man, that would be a lot of rehearsal. We got about we got about enough to do half half a show already. But we'd have to learn a whole lot more. And then it kind of morphed into, well, why don't we invite some other bands and just Tell everybody, you got to do Howlin' Wolf tunes. Do whatever you want. There's plenty of them out there, but let's do it. And so we just tried it. It was like Thursday night. Let's just do it. We got the run of the place for Thursday night. And I don't, we invited five or six other peep bands. Some were bands, some were just musician. We were like, oh, we'll back you up if you need it. Just do, let's, can we, can we do Howlin' Wolf from... 10 p.m. to 2 a.m. And not only did it work, but it was awesome. Like nobody had ever done that or yet, and everybody, Howlin' Wolf was such a charismatic legend. It was just so much fun. Uh, and we called it Wolf Fest. We're going to do Wolf Fest. We're going to play nothing but Howlin' Wolf, all wolf, all night. But it really was just supposed to be a one-time thing, we, and we decided to do it on Wolf's birthday, which happened to be a Thursday that year, so it worked out. And uh, it was just great. We had a ball. The next year, we didn't do it. And people were upset. Like people were coming, you guys aren't going to do a Wolf thing? And it was so much fun. Let's do it again. So we realized, man, pe- people remember that. It was fun. So it's created a thing, and so now, I, what was this year? Maybe the fourteenth year that we've done. We always do it on the Thursday closest to Wolf's birthday, and that's in November, June, June tenth. <laughs> June tenth. I think is his birthday, give or take a day or so. I'm sorry, I should know. So we always find the uh, the Thursday that's closest to that, and I just invite as many people out as I can get. But they just got to follow that one rule. You can only play Howlin' Wolf tunes. And now it's gotten big enough, like we were doing 30, 40 minutes the first time, as many tunes as we could pull off. Now there's enough people getting involved that's like, all right, you do three, you do three, you do three, you do three, you do three. And we're, we've expanded it. Now we go from 9 o'clock to 2 o'clock, and it never stops. We barely take breaks because we just leave all the gear up there and let people, so the changeovers are really fast, and it's just fun. We don't charge any money. I always say there's no cause. There's no cost, no cause, no anything but just 
just having a fun night to pull it off and just play five, six hours of Howlin' Wolf tunes by all these different bands and performers. If you repeat a song, whatever. And it's just kind of become a tradition that's really fun that now I can't get out of. No, no, you you, you, know, you definitely can't get I out of it. I missed a couple years here and there yeah. where I just thought, oh, I don't feel like playing this. I don't feel like putting it together because I'm not getting anything out of it. We don't charge any money. We don't sell tickets. We don't do anything. So I'd be, oh, this is, you know, anyone who's, if I don't know if you've ever put one together. If you ever put together an event, oh, it's a show, it's a just ton a, it's a of big work. deal. And you got to schedule it. And it's just, it's like for one night, you're a band leader for seven different bands, mm -hmm. you know? But when you're in the middle of it, it's just fun. And they need gear. Time. They didn't bring their guitar. Yeah, bring Can I use your bass? I mean, you know, it, 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 I want to play the song, you know, another song than what I yeah. said I'd play. Yeah, it's a ton but, of work. But it is a blast. It, it is, is a blast. As, a, as someone on the other end that gets to sing at it and gets yeah. to sit and watch it, it is a ton of fun. Yeah. And you get to see a lot of Atlanta. A lot of Atlanta's best people. Yeah. That, you know, we haven't moved it to a Saturday night for the exact reason. If I move it to a weekend... I got to charge money. I, it's even more difficult to book bands because now people are booked. Yeah. And I'm like, I just want to keep it loose. I just want it to be fun. Show up and play Halloween. The first number of years before you did it, I didn't even have a schedule. I was like, look, we're going to start at nine and we're going to go to two. And the Breeze Kings will start. And we'll play as long as we can or until other people show up and to play. And it's like, when you show up, I'll get you up whenever you have enough people. If you're missing one or whatever, we'll fill in. And it was, it was almost like a free for all. But as it got bigger and more and more bands were getting involved, people were bringing their whole band and they were like, Oh man, I really want to come, but I have to do this in the morning or I have a gig earlier that night. So I won't come till late. So I realize I can't get away after a couple of years. I can't get away with it just being a free for all. I have to actually have a schedule right. and a clock and run it to make sure everybody, if they're going to make the commitment to come down and play and I'm not going to pay them anything, then they get to get to play. At then least. I got to make sure that right. they get their time. Well, it's a, it's a cool night, but it's awesome. Yeah. It's a cool night. It is uh it's a, for sure. It's a staple of Atlanta. Mm -hmm. Something that we all look forward to every year. I, I love it. I love it. It's awesome. Well, and it always gives me a, uh, like a motivation to at least learn one or two new wolf tunes every year to throw in the mix because I am convinced and I don't have any proof, no data, but at the beginning when we started it, not. The blues scene was not doing as much Howlin' Wolf as it is now. Everybody always says they love Howlin' Wolf, but I believe Wolf Fest, and I'll, I don't know whether I'll get, people will agree with me, I believe Wolf Fest has injected more of Howlin' Wolf's legendary music into the Atlanta blues scene, because once these bands get together and learn the songs, now they're part of their set lists. You know, they're not going to learn it for one night and then forget it. Yeah. They start performing them. And maybe they have they sit down and they listen to a few Howlin' Wolf records and realize, man, this is really cool. And they're wondering which songs to do and and stuff like that. So I'm not, I, I'm not going to say I put Howlin' Wolf on the map because he's one of the all-time greatest legends in the music. But I think a lot of bands that weren't didn't include Howlin' Wolf tunes in their song list do now you know and i think that's cool and just like and they kind of came to the conclusion that you can do a howlin wolf tune without caricaturizing it yeah you know what i mean yep howlin wolf like was so unique go buy a howlin wolf record he was so unique in his voice and his performance and his intensity that when I've seen a lot of bands do Howlin' Wolf tunes, they make a joke out of it almost. Yeah. I don't know if they do intentionally, but it's kind of like when somebody does Elvis. 
you don't have to do the, you know, or James Brown. It's actually very good. Uh, you don't have to do those things. You don't have to do the caricature. James Brown's tunes were awesome. Just do it. You know, you don't have to be Eddie Murphy in the hot tub. You yeah. Know? And you don't have to say, you don't have to sing an Elvis tune and say, thank you very much at the end. You don't have to add that. The tune stands up on its own. Yeah. You know what I mean? So when you start seeing other bands do it and they do it their way and they get response, it's like, yeah, it's a great tune. Do it like your band would do it. You don't have to growl. You don't have to copy the mannerisms of Howlin' Wolf and stuff like that. And hopefully that carries on into everything. If you're doing a Jimi Hendrix song, you don't necessarily have to do Jimi Hendrix's solo note for note. You know? You know, it's funny you mention that. Though All those artists that you mentioned, they bring incredible intensity and energy. So one way to cheat your way to that is to make a caricature of it and go the caricature route. Right. It's a cop-out. Yeah. It's a complete cop-out. To try to capture that energy, it, 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 you know, that's all you need to do. Bring in that intensity and the energy. Uh, you know, and it's the rest a, take care of it. You're itself. right. It's that's what sets apart a real performance from just, you know, like great frontmen and great performers. They're putting on a show. You know, there's lots of people we could sit here right now and record. Some people are great recording artists. They can make a great record because they have incredible skills but put them in front of a big live audience and they can't hold their attention because they don't have a show you know any 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 concert has got to be at least 50 percent visual and 50 percent what you're listening to if not more towards the visual side and a lot of musicians forget that Nobody but you knows that you messed up that or you messed up that yep. or that you moved the treble knob on your amp from three to four. You know, they just know you're putting on a great show, you know, and uh, always have to keep that in mind. And all those guys going back to the blues guys like Helen Wolf uh, to the all time greats like. James Brown and Michael Jackson and Prince and all these guys like man you watch a video on YouTube and you're like look at this guy I can't take my eyes off of him yeah not only is he great at what he does but he's just riveting to watch there's no faking it up there you know and uh yet I think sometimes when you're perform and you have to be comfortable enough to kind of let yourself try to get into that zone even if it means you're a little self-conscious i like to think that all those things that were in the early days and then classic rock era the the pageantry the clothes they were they people were tuned in to the fact that this is a, a visual thing yeah. as much it's as a full it is show. It's a full, it's show. A full and show. Some bands seem to have lost that. And then when you see a band in 2018 that does that, it's like a novelty. Like, man, these guys put on this, the whole thing. I, I think we're still recovering from grunge. Maybe. And grunge pulled all of that out and made it, don't look at the crowd, wear don't your flannel. Look, maybe so. And, and do that they, thing, they, and that became the new cool. Yeah. And, and yeah, I'm just going to wear the same T-shirt that I was wearing on the bus here. Yeah. I'm just going to walk right up on stage with it. And I don't know, man, it, that's a tough one for me. I don't, I don't have any, I feel like I don't, I shouldn't have any problem with it. You wear what you want, whatever symbolizes the music you play. But because I play a throwback style of music, I still miss those days where it was a, performance i mean i've never gotten to the point where i can get like the band to wear cool matching outfits right. or anything like that but you know man when you watch those old videos on youtube and you see a you know a band that's just decked out oh, take freddie sharp, mercury 
take Freddie Mercury. You know? And you know? it it just kind of seemed to take the whole thing to another level. And uh, I don't know, man. I, I just love it. I love it. Well, this has been awesome. I could do. I could probably go another two hours. We probably could. <laughs> but, I certainly could. So I, I am. I don't even. What so? What is the theme? What are you going to call this? Since we just kind of went. I'm going to call this uh, Carlos talks his ass off. You, I told you. I warned you ahead of time. <laughs> no, I mean but this I is also, good though. But I get. We get a full. Like if anyone wants to know about the Breeze Kings, wants to know about Carlos. This is going to give you a good idea. We, yeah. We've got it. It's, there's nothing about today that's know, been man. anywhere near boring. This has been I awesome. hope not. This has I been hope excellent. at least they got, well, I had to listen to all that, but if anything, they got, like, the enthusiasm. The enthusiasm and the, is there. The, it's not faking it. Right. Because I, I told you before we even started – if I get into this, man, I get into it, I start thinking about it, and I got stuff to say, and I, I will. You'll have to cut me off. No, it's good. No, this has been great. First off, uh, I'll just say, personally, I'm a huge fan of yours. <laughs> just as a person, as we talk about great people, you are w- right in there. You are one of the one of the greats. Oh, I got you fooled. <laughs> you got me fooled. Uh, talent, musician, got you fooled. everything, you are fantastic. And I think when you think about Atlanta – and people want to talk about w- w- the fabric of Atlanta and what makes Atlanta Atlanta. The Breeze Kings at Northside Tavern on Thursday night is one of the things you put on the list. I hope so. For sure. So thanks for coming in. I appreciate it. Thanks. You are the band. And then uh, we'll, fex, we'll fest next year. And uh, in June, every yeah, Thursday think, night at Northside next year, Tavern. Right. Every you, Thursday night. BreezeKings.com. The full schedule is on there. Are you, can I do plugs? Heck yeah. I'm drinking Dr. Pepper. Boom. <laughs> and uh, if Samsung wants to, <laughs> <laughs> to get or Ray Ban wants to throw in anything. Yeah, absolutely. You know? Beautiful. All right, brother. Thank you, man. Let's do I it again. It. I love it. I, I hope this takes off for you. It's pretty Me cool. Too. Thanks, man. Appreciate it.